Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Welcome to it. It is the world famous Jiggy Jaguar radio broadcast. You know, I've got to figure this out. And I think what I'm going to do is that. And then do this. And do something else. I don't know. I got lots of moving parts here on our big program and uh welcome to it it is the big broadcast coast to coast border to border on iHeartRadio today amfm 24 heavencom yes indeed and of course 50 plus amfm stations across the country and around the world as i like to say and we are going to go to our first guest here in just a few moments before we get to our actual first guest on the line. But uh, lots of things happening around the world. Lot, lots of things. Lot, lots of things doing. There's lots of things doing, as they say. I don't know who's saying it. Don't know why they're saying it, but they are indeed, yes, indeed, saying it. Okay, see we're we're at a crossroads here because I have a pre I have some pre-tapes, but the pre-tapes are not that long. So if I go to the pre-tapes, um <laughs> we're not going to be able to get our first guest on. So I'm not sure what to do here. So we may just end up saying, screw it. (laughs) I may just say, screw it. And just get our first guest, which is Charlie Demokas. A return visit with the Florida-based author. He is going to join us here via the magic of the old telephone. He'll be on the traditional telephone, as they say. Uh, his, his great book, Walking with the Dead. He is going to talk to us here in just a few moments. The incredible Chalidamokas. I always call him Charles Demokas, but apparently he wants to be referred to as Chale. Chale Demokas. So we will refer to him as Charles Charlie Demokas when we get him on. So here's the deal. I think we're just gonna go straight to him. I'm going to see if this Twitch thing is still recording. Because uh, I thought I had Twitch going last week. And then come to find out I didn't. And we are going to rely more on Twitch on the um, recording end of things. Rather than YouTube. I think we're just going to put the shows up on YouTube and just pray and hope for the best. <laughs> but uh, I, I I don't know. I don't know what to say. I don't know who's playing us out, as they say. I, I got a, um, a deal in our chat room. I should be in our chat room over there on Twitch. But um, I am not. And I should go over and say hello to the people on Twitch. Since we are streaming on Twitch. I figured out on Twitch we can... Uh, basically stream the entire show and then I could go back in and I could make highlights 
So I'm not jumping off, jumping on, jumping off, jumping on to do the video to put it on our website. So that is quite a cool deal. So we are going to go to Charlie Namokas, the biggest star in the business. Forget about it. If you don't believe him, just ask him. He will tell you. So we are going to go to the great Charles Demokas. He doesn't want to be called Charles Demokas. He wants to be called Charlie Demokas. I'm going to call him Charlie Demokas based upon uh, what Irwin says. And I believe we might have Charlie. How are you, sir? Welcome yes. Back. Welcome back yes, to the James. program, Charlie. How are you, my friend? Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thanks for having me. So we have got a great, great guest with us today, the fantastic Charlie Demokas. He's got a return visit with us. He's based in the Florida area, and he joins us here on a broadcast. He's got a lot of new material to impart to our audience. And uh, so, Charlie, you have you worked in Irwin's PR office for several months. Tell, so, oh, more than several months. Quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> well, t tell us about working in the PR office of the legendary Irwin Zucker. Oh, my gosh. That, that's probably among the most exciting things I could uh, think about talking about. Um, well, I actually am not quite sure how I got to have the job. It was while I was in high school. It was probably I was probably referred there. Uh, to to the high school counseling session or um, you know job sessions that they had, but anyway, for whatever reason, Irwin uh, was nice enough to hire me um, as an assistant to the assistant, and I have to make that clear that I wasn't <laughs> the assistant; I was the assistant to the assistant. That's awesome. That's and, fantastic. And that alone was actually an incredible experience because the assistant's job was to take a lot of literary people around town or, you know, make contact with them or get them to their hotels or whatever, and also to get them to literary events as well as to various public events. So a lot of times he would uh, not be... Uh, available to do the more menial stuff, like drive them around, and that would become my job. At that time, I, I, I was driving, I'm, uh, uh, legitimately, <laughs> I should say. Uh, so uh, that was my first introduction to Irwin's office, and um, a lot of it um, involved meeting with and uh, uh, scooting folks around town who were uh, fairly well known at the time, and some of them uh, had both written books as well as uh, they had made recordings. Like one who comes to mind is Anne Margaret, who was, um, you know, writing a book and also appearing at a local concert hall. It actually wasn't a hall; it was a concert venue right on the beach. And so, but that was my job: is to uh, cart Anne Margaret around. You know, things like that. So it was wow. quite an experience. That's and, great. Um, uh, you, you know, it was a great high school job, what can I say? It is. And Charlie Irwin Lucas, was yes. amazing because, you know, he was doing so many different things. And this fellow I worked for who was his assistant, and I don't remember his last name. It was Tony somebody. I mean, he had, um, he kind of lived the Sunset Strip life which many people, I didn't really aspire to it, but he did. And that's what he did. He lived above the Whiskey A Go Go, uh, right on Sunset Strip, and uh, basically uh, would uh, take people to clubs and uh, screenings and things like that. Uh, so it was kind of the quintessential uh, L.A. life, even though it may not have been the quintessential literary life. So that was my introduction to Irwin. <laughs> That's great. We have got a great guest with us today. Charlie Demokas joins us. Walking with the Dead is the latest from him, and he is fantastic. He's a writer, he's a filmmaker, and he joins us today here on our big broadcast. 
So, Charlie, you've written screenplays, directed the Telly Award-winning feature documentary Return to Vietnam. What made you become involved with that film project as a screenwriter and a director? Because to win a Telly Award is a uh, pretty cool accomplishment. I worked with a guy at one point who won a Telly Award for a uh, for an MMA event that we covered one time. So I'm very familiar with the tellies. But uh, tell oh, us wow. about Return to Vietnam. Uh, absolutely. Thank you. And, you know, the reason I'm mentioning it is for a couple of reasons, because uh, it's not the, my most recent project. I think you know the most recent project is Walking with the Dead. Yes. But a couple yes. of things have happened with Return to Vietnam, which brought it back to my attention. One is that on one radio interview I had for Walking with the Dead here in Florida, uh, the gentleman who was the host also invited some Vietnam vets who, um, you know, to make a public service announcement for a local event they were having to raise funds that weekend. And I chatted with them, and unfortunately I didn't have a, I don't carry copies of it around with me, but uh, I was so impressed with them, and it kind of reinvigorated why I did get involved with making the film and what I hoped the film would help accomplish. Um, and uh, that was that when I was growing up, as many of us, we were greatly influenced by all the terrible things going on with the Vietnam War, and a lot of folks um, you know, were drafted. I, I guess I was very lucky. I had a number which didn't come up on the roulette wheel. Uh, so um, I always felt bad about that whole situation. That was really the kind of the luck of the draw. If you had the wrong number, you were shipped off to Vietnam. And, um, and that part was one part of the uh, issue, but the worst part, which is what the film, why I guess I got involved with making the film, was because when these folks came back, um, they were really, you know, they, they really still have a rough time in many places, you know, in terms of psychologically uh, coming back to the United, United States and uh, being accepted. A lot of people were opposed to them going to begin with, and they themselves, you know, had to face horrible things that happened in any war. Uh, let's face it, I mean, in any war there are horrible things that happen. And so I wanted to do something which would help uh, that kind of self-image and I met some folks who have an organization. At that time, it was on the West Coast, and subsequently, more recently, moved to South Carolina, called Vets with a Mission, who were the first or one of the first groups who started organizing trips to go back to Vietnam uh, for either vets who wanted to return and deal with uh, what happened, or, you know, other folks who wanted, like doctors who wanted to help uh, create health clinics or give medical service or uh, otherwise help out. And uh, so I basically, um, you know, was asked if I could make a film about one of their trips. And uh, so through a long process, uh, uh, ended up making Return to Vietnam with the help of some other people. And that, that was kind of uh, the way I became involved with it and why I wanted to make the film. That's awesome. We have got Charlie Demokas with us today. He joins us live here on our big program at 23 minutes past the hour. And uh, he is pretty damn amazing. He has got Return to Vietnam, a Telly Award winning feature documentary. He also is a, a fantastic author as well. So, with this um, Vietnam situation, um, what was filming like for this? Uh, t talk to us a little bit about the, the, the filming and everything, because th th this, uh, this is a pretty cool idea, this return to Vietnam. Well, okay, sure, yeah. It was um, definitely not the greatest place to go to to uh, make a film, and luckily the trip that I went along on and really physically prepared to go on because it, I knew it was going to be very, very difficult, uh, was in the winter. And even in the winter uh, uh, in February, 
temperatures were around 100, the humidity was close to that, and it was very, very difficult from a physical standpoint, not to mention a physical standpoint where uh, we had to carry equipment over there and things like that. So um, that was kind of the circumstances of making the film. And also, uh, at that time, and uh, it's been up and down. I, I mean, they keep going back, and in fact, this um, a few months ago was going to be the last trip that they were going to make, and I guess it's been canceled or postponed because of the pandemic, uh, which, you know, has been going up and down in Vietnam as well as, you know, everywhere. So um, at that time, the government was, uh, on the one hand, they liked the fact that Americans were coming back to help them, so they didn't want to say no to any legitimate group like Vets with a Mission, which was the name of the organization. But on the other hand, um, you know, they wanted to make sure that whatever images or story came out were under their control. And so the first screenplay that I wrote and submitted, they kind of changed. And, you know, I kind of got a queasy feeling about the whole thing. And we ended up not bringing regular cameras and not getting approval from the government because that would mean they, they insisted on checking all footage which um, which would be taken out of the country, and we didn't want that. I wouldn't agree to it, and neither would vets with the mission. So uh, we ended up taking, a couple of us ended up taking very small, personal, high-quality cameras in with us, and that's what we used uh, and got the footage to basically come back and edit it in the United States and put it together as a film. And uh, so it, it took quite a while, but uh, we were able to do it without censorship. We had done, my wife and I actually had done a film under similar circumstances in Russia previously. And um, so we had some background in doing, you know, films in strange, exotic locations where government censorship is, a, is an issue. Uh, on this film, um, I ended up becoming the director because this was just too much for her physically. And it was, it, it was definitely very strenuous, and it was probably just as well that uh, she was not there during the filming. Well, I'll tell you, th this is such a cool, cool topic today. We have got Charlie Demokas with us today. He's a writer, he's a filmmaker, and he joins us today here on our big program. And... Uh, so, how many U.S. and Canadians participated in this return to build the health clinic in central Vietnam? Um, the mission or the trip I went on, there were approximately 25 of us, wow. and I was actually struck by how many Canadians were there. I mean, I, did, <laughs> I myself did not re, re, realize that, I guess, during the war there were a number of other countries that sent uh, folks to fight in Vietnam, and Canada was certainly one of them. And so there, out of the 25 of us who were there, probably six or seven were from Canada. And uh, uh, maybe uh, three were medical doctors, and three were nurse practitioners. So the doctors and nurse practitioners basically would set up clinics. They had several clinics that had already been built by vets with the mission on previous trips where they, you know, did just basic health exams and uh, gave out prescriptions for medicines. And the Vietnamese would take those prescriptions more seriously than if a local doctor would give them out. So that was some service to a lot of people who, um, you know, may not have access to the local health uh, clinics, which were few and far between in Vietnam, and probably still are. Uh, so there were those health-oriented folks, the Canadians, and then there were probably about 15 or 16 uh, Vietnam vets or ex-American Vietnam vets, of whom uh, um, many, not all, but many had been back, uh, some had been back five times. Um, wow. Some of the ones had been back, you know, like five times in the last 10 years or something like that. A few had been, this was like, I had a roommate 
uh, on the trip uh, uh, was an ex-Marine, and this was his first time back. So it was quite, um, you know, quite emotional for him. But there were some um, who had been back a number of times, and they kind of saw this as a regular uh, mission or way to bring the two countries' peoples together, which I, I think it, it did help to do and does help to do. That's tremendous. It is Charlie DeMocus. He's with us today here on our big program. So you guys uh, went over there and, and got this got this film put together. You talked to us a little bit about the filming. Uh, was this film censored by the Vietnamese government or... Because I, I, I know you kind of well, talked, see, you talked I, a little earlier about that. No, we kind of snuck it out, uh, is really what it came down to, because um, we kind of had such small cameras, and uh, at that time using either cassettes, mostly cassettes, that looked like home uh, movie-type cassettes, that we weren't really bothered when we... Um, ended up leaving the country. So we kind of lucked out. It could have gone the other way. And in fact, one of the cassettes did disappear, which was kind of odd. And I don't really know if it was, you know, just coincidence or uh, whether it was censored. And that was the cassette where we went down into the tunnels. And uh, so I got some footage of that, but not the footage that I took. Um, I, with the camera, went into an underground tunnel that was, uh, I don't know, 80 to 100 feet down underground with a couple of the Marines, and we kind of crawled hundreds of feet through these tunnels and stopped in different rooms because during the war, I guess the North Vietnamese especially, came and dug these kind of labyrinth tunnels under South Vietnam, and that's where the local fighters would live and then they'd jump out and, you know, start a firefight with the American forces. So uh, that footage I see did seem to disappear, but it, it may have been an accident. I mean, it's hard to know. Uh, so for the most part, we got all the footage out. That's awesome. Charlie Namokas with us today, 31 minutes after the hour. Thanks for joining us here on our big broadcast. We are coast to coast, border to border on iHeartRadio today and also... KFRK in Denver, and you can watch a uh, video on our website, cheekycheckwire.com, as well. So, if a listener of this broadcast wants to find out about Return to Vietnam, how do they do this exactly? Well, that's another reason I wanted to mention this, because until recently, like last summer, I had several distributors for it. There was a TV distributor who liked the movie, but they, they were probably a little too big. They had it on uh, some small, you know, like Discovery channels. Um, and uh, the kind of shows they mostly do uh, are, you know, like they, they were the distributor for Three's Company, so mostly, you know, kind of sitcoms. Uh, so they stopped distributing it this summer. And also I got it back from Amazon, which I guess it's not just um, Return to Vietnam, but Amazon now only streams. So you can stream Return to Vietnam anytime on Amazon.com, just like any other film. But if you want a DVD, um, I guess, you know, I have to have a new access for that. So I, I'm working on that. And the composer who composed a beautiful lyrical score for the movie, he's rescoring the movie right now. So for the new DVD, we'll have that included. So I, I suppose awesome. if you're interested in having the DVD version, which I know most people are perfectly happy with streaming these days, but if you'd like a DVD, if you email uh, basically our company, which is Pompix at AOL, P O M P I X at AOL dot com, then I'll you know put you on the list, and when the DVD is finished, you know, we'll be glad to share it with you or send you a copy. And, um, you know, I, I'm not sure exactly how it will work. I know Amazon probably won't distribute it anymore because they, they don't distribute any DVDs, but we'll, we'll have another available source. That's and if awesome. you'd like 
more information on the film, we do have it on a couple of sites. One is um, the Palm Picks web website. It's called www.palmpicksweb, P-O-M-P-I-X-W-E-B.com web. And Return to Vietnam, there's reviews and award winnings and things like that. Um, and uh, it's not a full list because I, for, as with other projects I've done, like other films, I went around for about a year uh, going to different film festivals with it, and that was a lot of fun. Probably the most exciting one it was invited to is uh, the Monaco Film Festival in France. And um, so, you know, it kind of had that kind of a run before I gave it to the um, TV distributor um, and Amazon. But so um, there's information on pompixweb.com, and also there are a couple of trailers which are on YouTube, and those would be under the Pompix Web channel and it would be Returned to Vietnam by Charles Domokos. Fantastic. Charlie Domokos with us today. He joins us live here on our big broadcast. And uh, so you you have got this uh, in, incredible project here, Return to Vietnam. So what's next for you as a filmmaker, my friend? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I'm... Uh, Right now, as I say, just trying to tidy up the nuts and bolts of basically reissuing Return to Vietnam as a DVD. Uh, and um, so I'm working with the composer doing that. And also, I think I had mentioned before another sort of project like that. There was a film that we made. It, it, it was also, you know, did quite well. It played in theaters for quite a while, which for a feature documentary is pretty unusual, um, but it's called Bread and Salt, and uh, this is the one that basically Jean, my wife, directed, and I co-produced with uh, some folks both in Boston and uh, out of Moscow Central Television, and it's really about the end of the old Soviet Union and the coming of Russia. So that one uh, is one that, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to, again, release as a DVD because it was distributed both in theaters where it played for about six months and then um, on, at that time, on cassettes, on video cassettes, and it never had a DVD release. So that's another project. So I'm trying to kind of finish projects or redo projects like that before embarking on the next adventure, uh, which are probably uh, going to be smaller. I have a couple of smaller films that I've started. Um, one, in fact, uh, um, which is for children with cancer who are survivors, and it's about a little dog surviving cancer. So, That's awesome. um, you know, those are some other projects. So... Uh you have got uh, Walking with the Dead. This the, the, this is another great uh, project you're working on. Uh, tell us a little bit about this project, because you, you, you've got your hands in all sorts of things, Charlie. Well, yeah, I think I, I've talked about the book itself previously, which is um, it's an outgrowth of basically my work as a screenwriter and suspense writer for other people, and then eventually I wrote um, a story, uh, Walking with the Dead, about a, an artistic fellow, an opera singer, who in midlife becomes a probate attorney and um, tries to make a living, but all his clients end up getting killed, and he himself is put in danger. Uh, and it's kind of a humorous look at the entire um, mystery genre, and the, the book has gotten nice reviews. Uh, and I think I have mentioned that before, but the latest thing that has happened, which I think will be helpful, especially to uh, listeners who may be interested in reading it, is um, in November, which is, I guess, in a few days, something called the Midwest Book Review, which is... Um, sent to libraries all throughout, I guess, actually the entire United States, but mostly the Midwest areas. 
is coming out with a review and a promotion for um, Walking with the Dead. And that's something, uh, I guess, the publisher had submitted to them eight months ago or six months ago, and finally they um, are scheduling it for the November release. So once that is out, basically all the librarians, certainly in the Midwest and probably elsewhere, uh, will have access, and I'm sure some of them will be interested in um, having the book for their, um, you, you know, for their local libraries, and that's one way that folks um, who may be interested in uh, reading it uh, could read it uh, as a hard copy instead of as an e-book. I mean, it is an e-book, and uh, if you're a member of Kindle, then you know basically you can access a lot of e-books like Walking with the Dead. But otherwise. You know, it's, it may be hard for some people. Um, and to that effect, uh, we did have, the publisher had a giveaway on Goodreads and may have another one on uh, Kindle, but um, I'm not sure exactly what's happening on that. I talked to Irwin about it, and he said that may be postponed a bit. So that that's as much as I know Ir- Irwin Zucker, who, of course, we talked about earlier Fantastic. but uh, but Fantastic. I'm, I'm real happy with this Midwest book review and uh, the write-up coming out about the book and hopefully librarians will have it on their shelf for people to read we have got Charlie Demokas with us today he joins us live here on our big program coast to coast border to border on iHeartRadio today and also amfm 247.com Charlie Demokas uh, is with us. So, who are some of your favorite suspense and mystery writers? Um, well, you know, I've, I've given that some thought, and uh, oddly enough, the person who comes to mind first is not somebody who's usually associated with uh, crime or mystery type writing, and that's the Russian writer Fyodor. Dostoevsky, who, who I'm sure a lot of your listeners are familiar with, but some may not uh, be familiar with him. And he was a 19th century writer uh, in the late 19th century in Moscow and elsewhere. And among his best known books is a shorter one called Crime and Punishment. And I remember reading that in high school and out of high school. I read it a number of times, and it made a huge impression on me because it was very straightforward and matter-of-fact, but it was a crime novel. And at that time, especially in the 19th century, I guess that wasn't really considered a legitimate genre. So it wasn't called a crime novel. It was just called a, um, a dramatic book. And, uh, and it had all the elements of what a modern thriller or suspense book would have. Uh, I, I don't know if I should talk too much about the plot. Uh, it's very simple. It's this kind of starving student who basically kills his landlady uh, because he's broke, and um, then eventually he's tracked down and brought to justice. And so, you know, it's a crime story. And so that kind of struck with me as being a model for crime stories. And among um, the aspect is that it's very internally written. I mean, it's mostly from his psychological interior, and that, I think, is what gives it uh, depth and resonance, you know, a hundred years later or more. Uh, so I, I, I'd say certainly Fyodor Dostoevsky would be one of them. Certainly when I was growing up, the Sherlock Holmes story stuck with me um, as they did with just about everybody. Uh, As far as TV folks, I think uh, the closest that comes to uh, the character in Walking with the Dead are the two detectives in the series, if anybody recalls the series, Columbo and uh, Monk, those two uh, characters who are kind of, you know, bumbling and they're kind of uh, awkward and they kind of stumble around, but in the end, they do kind of give the uh, bad guy the comeuppance. And usually the bad guy is someone pretty well off, so there's sort of also that kind of social statement about folks who are, um, let's say, in high and mighty places 
being given their comeuppance and not getting away with whatever whatever uh, murder or malfeasance they committed. Um, so I, 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 you know, kind of like that approach to writing about characters such as the protagonists in Walking with the Dead. Uh, in terms of current writers, certainly one I always read who's just incredibly entertaining, and uh, he writes more for entertainment than anything else, I think, uh, is Stuart Barrington Detective Stories by the writer Stuart Woods. And the Barrington um, character is the opposite of, certainly of what Charlie Tobias is. Uh, Barrington is, uh, um, I'm sorry, Stone Barrington is, um, you know, he's very uh, elegant, very rich. Uh, he works in a big-time uh, attorney office in New York City. His relatives are all well-connected, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So a lot of it is kind of a, you know, kind of a James Bondish look at the legal mystery with a lot of humor. Uh, so it's a little different, but it, it's it's one of those kind of books that are simply written, but you can't put them down and you keep turning the pages because they're so entertaining. So I'd, I'd say those are some some of the influences I have. Fantastic. Charlie Demokas with us today. Charlie, before we let you go, how do people get in touch with you on the web, sir? Well, uh, a couple of ways. Uh, certainly, uh, if folks are interested in any film-type uh, projects, such as Return to Vietnam, we do have the www web website, and uh, folks are, you know, welcome or invited to uh, email me. And probably the easiest way is to pompix at aol p o m p i x at aol dot com. Uh, also, there's a separate website I have for Walking with the Dead, uh, and that website is Charles Domokos, all one word, author, C-H-A-R-L-E-S-D-O-M-O-K-O-S, author, A-U-T-H-O-R, of course, uh, dot com. So Charles Domokos, author for Walking with the Dead, and pompixweb.com for film projects. Fantastic. And Tom picks at AOL to uh, contact me via email. So love to hear from uh, either folks who have read Walking with the Dead or who might be interested in any of my projects.